Hey friends of Keyclock, nice to see you again. I'm Nico and I'm talking about Keyclock and authentication. Today I want to focus on some special topic, not really Keyclock related, but also, but authentication in general. Let's talk about Pixie, proof key for code exchange. What does it mean? What is it? How does it work? And why you should care about? Grab a coffee, make yourself comfortable, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so, and then let's start. As you might know, or at least as you should know, Keycloak is based on OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect is based on OAuth2, and OAuth2 defines several grant types. Most used grant type today is authorization code grant, but there was also the implicit grant, the resource owner password credential grant, client credential grant, refresh grant, and others. So um, for public clients like um, like a single page application, Java based, uh, JavaScript based applications uh, or mobile applications, the so-called public clients. Um, you can't um, effectively use the authorization code grant as it was designed in former days back in 2010, 2012, when uh, OAuth2 was released. Well, the world was different back then, um, at least the world of the internet was completely different. Um, the authorization code grant um, needs to uh, um, use a, a secret for the client to uh, change the authorization code into the tokens. So for a public client, you can't deploy a secret because if you deploy a secret to a browser or to a mobile phone, the public isn't a pub uh, the secret isn't a secret anymore. It's a public, and then it doesn't make sense to have a secret. Um, for these use cases, the implicit flow was designed, but as um, a lot of has changed in the meantime, the implicit uh, grant type is uh, completely deprecated and should not be used for OAuth 2.1, which will be hopefully released uh, in, the, in the next future. Um, the implicit grant type is omitted, um, doesn't work anymore. And um, completely uh, um, uh, leave out the resource owner password credential grant. This is completely insecure. This is also deprecated and must not be used today. So what can we do for public clients uh, when using the authorization code grant? Well, the solution is called Pixie, proof key for code exchange. And um, it was also already designed in 2015. So nearly 10 years old now and um, nearly nobody uses it. Why? The good uh, news is it became um, it becomes um, a must setting, a, a mandatory setting uh, with uh, OAuth 2.1, and um, every type of client must use uh, Pixie in the future. You can use it already today. Um, it's highly recommended to uh, be used in public clients. If you don't use it in public clients, um, uh, you're completely insecure from today's uh, security perspective and uh, re you really should use um, all this stuff. Let's take a look um, what happens if you don't use um, Pixie and how you can um, uh, make use of Pixie. How does Pixie work? So let's switch to um, our browser. Um, I have the login screen of um, a random application. That's the account console from uh, Keycloak and um, it uses by default uh, Pixie. And um, if I omit the uh, relevant um, query parameters for Pixie, I get an error message. Something went wrong. An unexpected error has occurred. There are no details in the browser, but we can see uh, um, an error event in the Keycloak um, admin console. If we switch to uh, our um, UI, we can see there's an, a login error, no user details. Of course, we didn't have uh, an authentication. And we get uh, the message missing parameter code challenge method. And this reason, the missing parameter code challenge method, means that you have to use Pixie, the proof key for code exchange. Um, before I show you how to configure it in Keycloak, um, I will show you how um, Pixie works. Let's switch to my presentation. Pixie proof key for code exchange. And um, basically, 
when a user or a resource owner wants to access a protected resource or wants to um, log in at the client, at the client application, just hits a button or requests in your protected URL. And normally the client would now redirect to the identity provider. With enable Pixie in the client, um, the client um, will first calculate a code verifier, the so-called code verifier. It's um, a random string, should be at least uh, 32 characters long and uh, completely random. It's um, a clear text code verifier. Over this code verifier, the client calculates a SHA-256 hash. That's the so-called code challenge. This code challenge and the method how this challenge is being uh, calculated, the SHA-256, is being added to the as query parameters to the redirect URI to the identity provider. So we're doing now the regular HTTP redirect to the authorization endpoint so that the user can authenticate together with the client ID, the redirect URI, the scopes, uh, and so on. And now also the code challenge and the code challenge method. So the code challenge, remember, it's the hash and the hash method, how we um, calculated the hash. The identity provider itself checks if these um, informations are available. If not, we're getting the error message we just saw uh, in Keycloak. And then the identity provider, if everything's um, available, uh, the identity provider will do the uh, authentication. The user um, authenticates, um, perhaps gives its consent, and um, then will be redirected back with the authorization code uh, back to the client application. So the application um, here at the bottom is the same as in the top. I just put it uh, in, in two places for a better overview. So the client now needs to exchange the authorization code to um, the actual token response. If you have a confidential client and have a secret, um, so long you have just um, sent the authorization code together with the client ID and the client secret in the back channel request to the um, identity provider and got back the uh, access token response. In a public client, you don't have the secret and therefore now um, you have the proof key for code exchange what is a kind of a one-time identifier for um, the client. And the client now uses the authorization code, sends the author authorization code to the token endpoint of the identity provider together with the code verifier. So the clear text part, not the hash. The hash was sent in the first request and the second request to exchange the authorization code to the tokens. The code verifier will be sent to the identity provider. The identity provider now calculates from the code verifier with the code hash, uh, with the code challenge method from the first request, an own challenge, and now compares the sent challenge from the first request with the calculated challenge from the code verifier. And only if these two values are exactly the same, um, then the um, identity provider can be sure that both requests came from the same client. Um, and then the identity provider um, may send the HTTP response with the access token, identity token, um, refresh token, whatever. So only if the, the calculated um, challenge with the send challenge is um, the same, the identity provider um, must send uh, the token response. If it's not the same, um, the identity provider must respond with, uh, with an error. And uh, the red parts, you see this is a pixie. This is proof key for code exchange. For every new um, authorization request, a new code verifier and a new code challenge is uh, calculated from the client. So the client does only uses a code challenge, code verifier a pair only one time. It's only one, uh, one time uh, valid. If it's already used and you try to use it again at the identity provider, the identity provider um, has to respond with an error. So a man in the middle can't use um, a code challenge or a code verifier which has been used before again. And um, this makes it hard for attackers to, uh, to mitigate in the communication between um, the client and the identity provider and to obtain access to uh, the, uh, the token response. From today's perspective, this is secure enough, whatever that means, um, to have um, a secured connection 
between uh, or a trusted connection between the client and the identity provider to exchange the authorization code and the tokens without having a secret. This is valid for public clients. And well, with um, in the future, when OAuth 2.1 is released, um, you have to use Pixie also for your confidential clients. Then you have the client ID, the client secret, and Pixie. Um, why? Because it adds another layer of security and it doesn't hurt. It's not that effort today to calculate a SHA-256 hash from um, a random string. For all of you, um, who wants to have some uh, sequence diagrams. I also have a, a sequence diagram provided. Um, you have here um, the, the request resource, the login request uh, at the client um, before the client uh, redirects to the authorization server or identity provider. The client generates the code verifier and the code challenge. Then we're being redirected with the code challenge and the code challenge method to the authorization server. There, the user um, does the login and uh, the consent. Then the authorization server generates the authorization code, redirects back the user to the client with the authorization code. The client then uses the authorization code and send the code verifier in a post request to the authorization server. The authorization server generates the uh, own challenge from the code verifier and uh, compares the computer challenge with the send challenge from the first request and then answers with the token, uh, token response. That's all. Pretty neat. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, it was uh, already defined in 2015. The specification was uh, finalized in two, five, uh, two, two, 2015, sorry. And it was designed for OAuth2 um, explicitly. Um, and as you um, use OpenID Connect, which is based on OAuth2, you can also use it in OAuth2, uh, in OpenID Connect, of course. So going back to our browser in Keycloak and see how all this works properly. If we hit try again, we restart a new authentication and um, I already open up the network tab to um, see the, the request to reload. I have the basic request to the authorization endpoint and in this authorization endpoint, we see there is um, the code challenge method and the code challenge information um, uh, as query parameters to uh, um, the, the Keycloak server to the identity provider. And we can now um, authenticate at the identity provider. And after a successful authentication, the user is being redirected with um, uh, the, uh, the actual authorization code. And um, we have the token request. And in this token request, that's the post request to the token endpoint. Um, we have uh, the payload, uh, the authorization request, uh, the authorization code itself, and the code verifier, which will be sent to the Keycloak server, to the identity provider. The identity provider will compare the code verifier um, with um, this um, code challenge from the first request. Uh, they are base 46, uh, base 64 encoded, will de uh, be decoded and then uh, calculated, compared, and if everything's fine, like in our case, we get back the response with the actual tokens. And this makes um, life much more secure in, um, in public uh, environments and in future also in all environments. In Keycloak, uh, in um, your client, you have to enable um, the Pixie that is, uh, can be used. So for the account console or also for the um, admin console, it's uh, enabled by default. It's a little bit hidden. It's in the, on the last tab, the advanced tab, and on the advanced tab in the advanced sec settings. Uh, don't know who thought this was a good idea to have an advanced tab with advanced settings, but different story. In the advanced settings, uh, somewhere in the middle, you have um, the proof key for code exchange code challenge method. And um, this is um, at uh, S256. This means it is enabled um, to have uh, the Pixie. And um, the default um, would be choose. Choose is it's off. Um, if it's off, Keycloak doesn't request the code challenge and the code challenge method in the authorization request. The client can send the information, but Keycloak uh, wouldn't um, uh, um, use it. If you turn it on with S256, 
you have to send it. There's no way around. Keyclock requests the information. If the information is not there, um, Keyclock will deny um, the uh, the communication as we saw before with the error message. And there's a fallback um, method, the plain method, which is not an actual um, uh, hashing method. It was meant in earlier days for environments where you don't have a SHA-256 uh, possibility, but I don't know of any environments today of modern environments where you can't use a SHA-256 hashing algorithm. So um, plain shouldn't really be used. Um, stick to S-256 as your code challenge um, method for Pixie. It's a little bit hidden, but uh, once you have discovered it and once you set it the first time, you will remember it um, for every other time again. So now that you know how Pixie works, what Pixie is, there's no reason not to use it, I think. What do you think? If you ask yourself how to use Pixie in your client application, don't worry. Basically, you shouldn't care about it. Your, uh, your, your, your library should care about it. Um, your library you're using for doing OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect. Most modern libraries um, support to use Pixie and um, you just have to enable it and then the library will care about everything Pixie related. So just enable it, look into the docs of your um, used library and how you can enable Pixie and then just do it, use Pixie, enable it on the Keyclock side, on your identity provider side to enforce the usage of proof key for code exchange. And then make the world a little bit safer. I hope you liked this video. If yes, give me some thumbs up and um, of course, subscribe to my channel and turn on the bell so that you don't miss any of my other videos. And uh, yeah, stay safe, stay healthy. See you soon. Bye bye.